Good evening, confirmation students. Welcome to session number 12. This is the 13th of January, 2021. Tonight we will be doing lesson number one. We're switching from the Ten Commandments and going into the Lord's Prayer, which will be here for a few weeks. And so you'll want to make sure that you have this worksheet printed out. It's attached to the email with tonight's link on it. Also, you received on that uh, same email a supplemental sheet. I would encourage you to have this out. This might be a little bit easier for you to use tonight than your Bible since one of our readings will actually be reading two different versions from two different Gospels. So maybe instead of flipping back and forth, if you have this open, I've put them side by side. So maybe a good idea to have uh, the supplemental sheet either printed out or at least up on your device. Uh, and we'll be thinking about a couple different versions of the Lord's Prayer that you find in the New Testament. Next Wednesday evening, it'll be the 20th of January. We are going to meet again in person. Uh, six o'clock downstairs here in New Richland. Uh, for those of you who are quarantined, uh, I am able now to do some live streaming from the basement since we upgraded our Wi-Fi around the church. So uh, if that happens to be you, you'll get some information next week uh, about how to, to tune into that. But the rest of us, we're going to make a good go of it to be in person for the rest of the year. I'm glad you guys are in school, at least part-time, and hopefully that'll be moving to full-time as well. But it's uh, going to be nice to be back together. For tonight, though, let us begin with the introduction to the Lord's Prayer. Our general theme for tonight is, is prayer, what is prayer, and in particular, what's the Lord's Prayer? If you've got your worksheet in front of you, we're going to do our opening as always. It's under the big number one. I will be L, leader, UBC, confirmand. This comes to us from the Old Testament tonight. 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 28 and then 38 through 40. Have regard to the prayer of your servant and to his plea, O Lord my God, listening to the cry and to the prayer that your servant prays before you this day. Whatever prayer, whatever plea is made by any man or by all your people Israel, each knowing the affliction of his own heart and stretching out his hands toward this house, then here in heaven, your dwelling place, and forgive and act and render to each whose heart you know according to all his ways. For you, you only, know the hearts of all the children of mankind, that they may fear you all the days that they live in the land that you gave to our fathers. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for hearing our prayers. By your Holy Spirit, Help us to come to you in every time of need and give you praise for your grace and mercy. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. What we need, let's go up to the top of page number four. You'll see a picture there of a bird, worm in her mouth, feeding her young ones. Maybe you've seen that happen uh, maybe around your yard. We do have birds that nest in our yard, and it's always kind of fun to watch. And when you see that, that's a good image for us to use for prayer. Have you ever seen baby birds in a nest stretching up their necks to be fed by the mother of the bird? Baby birds cannot take care of themselves. They're nearly blind. They can't walk, fly, or get their own food. But when the mother bird comes, they strain their necks and heads upward. They look to their mother, knowing that she will bring them what they need. As we begin our study on the Lord's Prayer, this image is a good place to begin. To pray is to look to God in trust and in faith, calling upon our Heavenly Father as the source and giver of all good things. You're at an interesting time in your lives right now. My kids are maybe a couple years behind you, but uh, this is on our minds as well. That when you start getting into junior high and certainly into high school, it seems like each year you take some steps towards independence. Maybe your parents give you some additional responsibilities, things they used to do for you, but you can do for yourself now. Uh, pretty soon, you'll probably have jobs and you'll start making your own money and you become more 
dependent. You're growing in confidence that you'll be able to go out into the world and to survive and to make your way and uh, to find something meaningful to do. And that is a, a good and perfect thing for you to be doing right now. But here's the thing. I'm in my 50s. This picture of me being dependent on God, even though I've been independent of my parents now for, I think, probably 31 years, this picture does not change for me. And it probably hasn't changed for your parents either. Yeah, I'm able to do things that uh, once my parents did for me, but there are certain things that our Heavenly Father can only do for us. Things that even as old as uh, I might be and even older than that, you'll find people in our 90s in this congregation who still feel uh, the very real need to pray to God and to ask Him to provide for their needs. And so while you're becoming more independent from your parents, uh, the point of your growing up years here is not to become more independent of God. We'll always be dependent on Him. Let's move down. Prayer as a request to God. The Bible says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. That comes to us from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 4. Uh, so our theme word for the night is prayer, to call upon or make a request to God, expressing our dependence upon God in faith. Now the English word pray comes from the root word meaning to ask or request. In the olden days, maybe if you ever watch any uh, maybe old period movies where people speak with British accents, eh, not my favorite movies, but sometimes I end up watching these things and you'll see them say something like, oh please, I pray thee. That's their way. They're not praying to God. They're asking for something, and that's where the root of this word pray comes. It means to ask or request. Of course, any time we talk to God is a prayer, whether silently or out loud. From a printed page, like we might do in church, or spontaneously in the moment, like I might do at the end of this video. I might do. I will do. But as we'll see in the Bible, it is important to remember that the heart of prayer is a request to God an expression of our trust and our dependence on him. Let's flip the page. We'll be on page number five. The prayer that Jesus taught us. By his words and deeds, Jesus demonstrated the importance of prayer in our lives of faith. Throughout the Gospels, there are many references to Jesus praying, especially prior to a significant action or event in his life. And as a rabbi, a Bible teacher, Jesus also taught his followers about prayer and even gave them words to say. One of the best answers to why should I pray is because Jesus, who is the Son of God, practiced it. He would oftentimes go away and, and be alone and he would pray to his Heavenly Father. He was dependent on God as well in the same ways we are. And so if that's important for Jesus, we uh, ought to be wise and say, I guess that's important for us as well then. Well, let's go to our first Bible story today. Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 12. It's either on your supplemental sheet, and again, I would encourage you to read off of there because we're going to do some comparing uh, in the middle of this lesson. But if you do have your confirmation Bible and you want to read along there, uh, it's page 1146, 1146. Well, if you've got your supplemental sheet out, let's go ahead and read together. And as we do this, when we get down to the, uh, the table that's embedded in there, uh, it's got the two columns. As we're reading through this the first time, I want you, when we come to that part, just to read down the left-hand column where it says Luke's version. Uh, and then we're going to go back in a minute and bring in Matthew's version. and Let's see how they match up. But let's read Luke 11, verses 1 through 12. Jesus was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. Jesus said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins 
as we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, Do not bother me. The door has already been locked, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he'll get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, Jesus says, ask, and it will be given to you. Search, and you will find, knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who searches finds, and for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, you'll give a scorpion? Well, let's answer some questions here. No doubt the words of this prayer sound familiar to you. These words come from the Bible and they're the basis of what we call then the Lord's Prayer. It's gonna be important to know that the Lord's Prayer uh, took on its final form probably a couple centuries after uh, Jesus lived. Uh, so the way that we say it now. But no doubt the prayer was taken from this version and then Matthew's version, which we'll kind of look at here in a second. We call this the Lord's Prayer because it is the prayer that our Lord taught us to use. And so question A right there, from what Jesus describes here, would you say that prayer is more like making a wish or asking for a favor? What's the difference between the two? What would you think? Is it making a wish or asking a favor? I think the uh, probably best answer here would be asking for a favor. A uh, couple of things that point that out. Number one, we are asked to call God Father. It implies that there's a relationship there. And so if uh, any of my kids come to me, I, I would hope that they're not simply hoping that uh, all of the luck in the universe is going to uh, get them a cookie. I think they would come to me and say, Dad, can I have a cookie? And they're making a request. It, it's not something that uh, they're hoping is just somehow maybe gonna possibly work out. They're gonna rely on the fact that I'm their dad and that I love them. Doesn't hurt that I like cookies either, right? Uh, there should be a confidence here that God is a good dad, the best dad, the ultimate of the dads. And so we're to go to him in confidence that way. When we think of it as uh, luck or magic, we don't really honor the relationship there. We're just kind of crossing our fingers and hoping something just might happen instead of depending on God to be good and to give those things. So I think there may be uh, asking a favor would be the best way. Question B, Jesus says that even human fathers know how to give their children good things. It's true. Why is it important to know that God is our heavenly father? We should probably say here that our earthly fathers uh, aren't perfect, right? And yeah, maybe some of them far less than perfect. I know I'm not perfect. Uh, and yet uh, my children come to me and they depend on me. And, uh, and I do my best uh, to be a good father to them. That doesn't mean I know everything. And sometimes I say yes to things maybe I shouldn't have. And sometimes I say no to things and later on realize I should have said yes to that. Eh, that's part of, part of being a parent. You'll experience that one day possibly. But in this uh, Bible passage here, what Jesus is doing is he is, it's called making an argument from the lesser to the greater. He's taking something that is true on earth and saying, if this is true on earth, then it's really true in heaven, all right? And so if on earth fathers try to be good fathers and, and to give their children what they need, then how much more is a perfect heavenly father gonna do the right thing at the right time? And so, why is it important that God is our Heavenly Father as we, we think of things of the earth and then we think better because God is in heaven? 
The last thing we're going to do here, question number C, this is why we put a table into that first reading. Compare the text from Luke with the version of the Lord's Prayer that is found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. Are the differences significant? And which one is more like the one that we use in church? So let's go line by line back to that table on your supplemental sheet. Luke's version says, Father, hallowed be your name. Let your name be holy. I set your name apart from any other name so that I can call on it, pray to you, praise you. Father, hallowed be your name. Matthew's version, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Both of them have that word father. Matthew talks about a father being in heaven, uh, locating where God is. But essentially, they're about the same. Luke's version, your kingdom come, this kingdom of God that Jesus came to to bring to the earth, to speak about, and this kingdom that he one day promises will replace the broken kingdom of this world. It's the very last couple of chapters of the Bible, the brand new creation. Each time we say the Lord's Prayer, we're saying, God, your kingdom come. Not only that kingdom, but even here and now, uh, little advances of that kingdom. Um, these things we pray for when we pray the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come, Luke says. Matthew's version, your kingdom come. But he adds the part, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We imagine heaven to be a place of perfection. And in this prayer, we say we're hoping and, and praying and trusting in you, God, that you will bring that good kingdom to the earth. More and more today, but ultimately in the future, we know that you'll do that for real, uh, forever. Next one, give us each day our daily bread is what Luke says. Give us this day our daily bread, Matthew. About the same there, daily bread, everything that we need to exist. That's not just a, a loaf of bread on your table, but it is everything that we need. It's a, a roof over our head. We live in Minnesota, we need some heat. Uh, we need water, we need uh, ways to grow up. I mean, our schools are daily bread, right? This is the place uh, that teaches us stuff that we'll need to know so that later in life we can we can have a job and provide for our families and, and add something productive to society. Having good government has been kind of a rough couple of weeks in America and, and we continue to pray for good government as part of daily bread. Because when the government works, the people are well cared for. That's one of the reasons people are real nervous these days uh, is that we don't see a real stable government. We start being afraid that all these other needs won't fall into place. And so whenever I pray for daily bread, I, I think of the government as well. Anything you can think of that you need to survive is part of daily bread. And in future lessons, we'll come back to that one. But since we're talking about government a lot these days, a yeah, good one to mention. Forgive us our sins, Luke says, as we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. Matthew says, and forgive our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. You know, people wrong us on a regular basis and we're to forgive them. Why? Because we wrong God on a much more regular basis and in Christ he has forgiven us. And so we're to reflect that generosity that God has had towards us in forgiving our sins. We extend that to others. The other thing that does, and it's, it's not happening a lot in America right now. People are not forgiving other people, right? We're holding grudges instead and yelling at each other. And is it making things better? I don't think so at all. Here, I think America could listen to Jesus a little bit. It's time to forgive those people uh, that we feel are indebted to us. Next one down, don't bring us to the time of trial, says Luke. Matthew says, and don't bring us to the time of trial, but deliver us from the evil one. There's a prayer of, of protection here, and this is an especially powerful prayer for us to be praying uh, these days, not only for ourselves, but for our nation as well. I mean, when Jesus gave us this prayer, he gave us a whole lot of good stuff that on a regular basis, using these words, we are actually asking God for. And to go back to that image of the bird, some of these things are not things that we can do for ourselves. We're, we're dependent on God for so much. And the wonderful thing about the Lord's Prayer, he says, I'm going to give you the words to help you to ask for those things that you need. So I think uh, in the end, Matthew's version is probably the one that's closer to the one that we recite in church. And that's probably the same one uh, that you've memorized as well.
And you'll notice that uh, in the first couple of years of church history, they add on that part at the end, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. And even as you travel around to different churches, even within our own area here, uh, during Lent, I used to travel around other churches and each time I went in, I'd have to say, now which version of the Lord's Prayer do you use? Because sometimes there's subtle little different words. Forgive us our sins, forgive us our trespasses, forgive us our debts. But by and large, we're all praying the same thing. It's very close to what Jesus taught his disciples to pray. All right, top of page five, advice on prayer. When teaching about prayer, Jesus not only taught his disciples what to do, but he also told them what not to do. So look up the verses below and write down what Jesus said to do or to not to do when you pray. And again, I'll refer you to the, your supplemental sheet there, uh, since I have already put them uh, right on the sheet and you don't have to flip around too much. First one, Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 to 45, you can read with me. Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. God uh, gives rain to all of us. And what part of this, uh, part of this prayer here is, is Jesus says you should ask for good things for your enemies as well. Uh, one of the things when you start praying for people, by the way, that you don't necessarily like, or maybe people that have treated you badly, you start to actually look at them differently when you're asking for God's goodness and his blessing to be in their lives. Maybe it will be that one day that person will become one of your best friends. Hard to imagine it right now, but that is the power of, of prayer. And this is what Jesus does. He transforms relationships. And so they answer the first one, pray for those who persecute you. Ask for good things for them. God, if I want you to take care of me today and to bless me and to forgive me, I'm going to ask that for so-and-so. Even right now, they really tick me off. Number two, Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 6. Let's read together. And whenever you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. A hypocrite is somebody who is two-faced. Don't be like the hypocrites. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they will be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. So what's the advice Jesus just gave you here? Don't draw attention to yourself. Prayer is not a show. Prayer is not something that, uh, well, sometimes we have to pray public prayers, especially when we're in worship. Um, but it is not a show to draw attention to ourselves, to show everybody how great and religious I am. No, this, Jesus says, no, go, go into your bedroom. Another one says, actually go into the closet of your bedroom and uh, even pray there. This is about you and God and, and a relationship and a discussion that you're having. It's not meant for anything else than that. And so treat it that way. Number three, Matthew chapter six, verses seven and eight. This is right after that. The whole section where Jesus is teaching on prayer. Let's read. When you're praying, do not heap empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think that they're going to be heard because of their many words. Don't be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. I'm a bit that way with my kids. I don't know all of their needs, but sometimes when somebody walks up to me, I already know what they need, right? Uh, and yet, you know, what I, you know what I really want? I want them to say, Dad, I need some help with this. Dad, can you, it, it, because then there's a relationship there. I get to be the dad and they get to be the kid. And, and God wants that same thing from us, right? He knows everything. I don't know everything my kids want, I can guess. God doesn't have to guess. He already knows it even before it comes out of our mouths. But God so highly prizes the relationship, the back and the forth that happens in prayers that he says, even though I already know, I want to hear from you. I want to hear you call me father. And I want you to know that I listen to you as my child. So don't, don't, 
don't go heaping up a, a whole bunch of words together here. It says that's not what you need at all. Actually, since your father already knows it, you just simply tell him. He probably actually can read your mind and your heart better than you can put into words. I know I'm certainly like that. I stumble over words all the time. God knows exactly what we need. And then number four, verses 14 through 15. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. That one's kind of a serious one. Maybe you can think of a time in your life that I'm never forgiving that person. Well, I hope you will reconsider that, especially in light of Jesus' words here. Right? If God is going to forgive me, I don't get to turn around, and Jesus told other parables about this, I don't get to turn around and say, yeah, I know I'm forgiven by God, but there's no way you're getting forgiveness from me. That's insulting to God, really. Right? What I've trespassed against God is so much more than what anybody's going to do against me. Right? Uh, and the thing is, when I forgive people their sins, it actually helps me to know that mine are forgiven as well because you, you have to practice a little bit of the heart of God. I could have something against this person, and yet I am going to do what God has done to me. Right? And there's something liberating about that. Plus, you don't run around with a bunch of anger and, and ill feelings toward people. You let that go, and you can move on. This is what God wants for us, and this is something that then we do in prayer. A lot of the work of forgiveness actually is... Uh, worked out as, as we pray to God. God, I need help doing this because I don't like that person. I'm really angry at them. Uh, take that to God. He wants to hear about that. He's your heavenly father. You're his child. He prizes that relationship. Bottom of page five, catechism practice. Maybe you've got your Luther's small catechism, like I do. Uh, if you do, we're on page number 17. It will be up at the top, the part that's called introduction. Otherwise, on your supplemental sheet on the back side there, you will find uh, the introduction to the, Lord's, uh, to the uh, Lord's Prayer. And so let's read together. The introduction. Our Father, who art in heaven. What does this mean? Together we read. God encourages us to believe that he is truly our Father and that we are truly his children so that we may boldly and confidently pray to him, just as beloved children speak to their dear father. Go ahead and hit pause if you'll fill out that blank in your worksheet. And by the way, when you're done with your worksheet tonight, I forgot to mention it earlier, but again, uh, either take a picture of that and email it back to the uh, email address I sent you the link on, or since we're together next week and you've got a bunch of these maybe saved up in your house, I hope some of you do, uh, bring them to me next week. But go ahead and hit pause and fill in the blanks. I'm guessing since uh, you are back, you're done filling in all of those blanks. Thank you for doing that. Over on the right hand side, some of the important words that you wrote down. Our Father is nobody else but God himself. We are born as creatures of God. All people are, are creations of God. But in Jesus, God adopts us as his children and he addresses us as such. And you see there, there's a couple of Bible verses that uh, that's really clear that God intends us to think that way. Our Father is God himself. What about when we say, who art in heaven? What does that mean? This is an old-fashioned way of saying, God, you are in heaven. The Bible refers to heaven as being God's dwelling place. Is it way up above the stars? Is it a different dimension that's all around us at some time? The Bible doesn't really go into detail in saying where it is. It's something that we don't see at this point, but we believe and trust that uh, this thing that the Bible calls heaven, that that's where God is. And as a matter of fact, what do we say in the Apostles' Creed? Jesus ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of his Father. So Jesus himself in heaven as well. He truly is our Father, the last one. God is not simply a heavenly reflection of our heavenly fathers. No, uh, earthly fathers are an incomplete and imperfect reflection of our heavenly fathers, maybe the better way to say that. God is the example of what true fatherhood means. And any of us who have become dads, especially Christian dads, 
we're constantly looking uh, and thinking about God's fatherhood over us and saying, uh, how can you help me to be a better earthly father to my children because you're a perfectly hev heavenly father, perfect heavenly father to me. So, page six, bringing our petitions. Have you ever been asked to sign a petition? I don't know if you've got petitions going around school. We want to change our mascot from a panther to a... I don't know, I should have thought of something better before I stood here. The New Richland, Heartland, Ellendale, Geneva... Let's go with bison, right? You want to change the mascot to the bison, right? And so you'll draft up a little petition and you'll send it around and hopefully get a bunch of people to sign it saying, yeah, I don't like panthers, but buffalo, those are cool, right? Um, maybe you've signed a petition. It's an official written request made of the civil government or maybe your school. Often under the law, a certain number of people must sign a petition in order to make it valid. In religious terms, we use the word petition to refer to the individual requests that we bring to God in prayer. For example, the Lord's Prayer has seven petitions, and we'll be doing them one at a time here in the coming weeks. Seven things that we are asking of God in the Lord's Prayer. Seven things that God has said, here, ask me for these things. By the way, uh, if your, your parent says um, to you, ask me if I'll give you a cookie, right? You should probably at that point say, can I have a cookie? Right? Uh, unless they're going to pull a joke on you and say, no, just kidding, I ate them all. God doesn't act like that. If God tells you you should pray these things, then when you pray them, you should have some confidence that God is going to also answer those prayers. It's pretty cool. Seven things God gives us to pray. So in this unit, we'll examine each of those petitions to see what Jesus is telling us to ask of God. The reason we bring our petitions to God is because we know that God has the power to make things happen. He's the creator of the heavens and the earth. We trust in our Father's love and wisdom to do what is best for us. Skip across to the top there. More than magic, you see maybe the, the genie's lamp there. I think of that uh, movie Aladdin. Uh, Robin Williams played the genie and did a great job there. But you, you get that lamp and you rub it, right? Many Arabian folk tales tell of people who find a special container, lamp, or bottle with a magical genie trapped inside. And in such stories, it's said the genie will grant three wishes to the person who sets it free. Right? So you ask two wishes and well, what's the third wish always? I want three more wishes. That's the way we play that game. Unfortunately, many people imagine that prayer works like these wishes in fairy tales. But prayer is more than magic. Prayer is communicating with Almighty God, the ruler of the universe. And we don't control God. He does not have to give us exactly what we ask for. As a matter of fact, he probably shouldn't because sometimes I don't ask for the things that are probably the best. I might think they're a good idea, but maybe God says, oh, not, not right now, or no, I, I've got a better plan than that. And yet, we are called to ask. As the Bible says in Psalm 115, verse 3, our God is in the heavens and he does whatever he pleases. We should not think of prayer as trying to control God. Now, we try to control people around us, maybe even try to control your parents, right? You can't control God. And I like that about God, right? Uh, he's, he, yeah, you can't back him into a corner. Nobody else is going to do it either. He's going to do what he thinks is right at that time, and he'll do it in his own way. So prayer is not a magical wish, but it's something rather based on a relationship with a real and living being, our Heavenly Father. Our prayer is always dependent upon him and his will. What does he want done? God promises to hear and answer the prayers of his children, but sometimes God's answer to our prayer is no. Especially if you want to buy yourself a Lamborghini or you want God to give you a Lamborghini. I'm guessing the answer is going to be no. That is probably not God's will for you. I'm just going to go out there on a limb and say that's probably true, right? Sometimes we think God, we just ask him for stuff like he's Santa Claus. That's probably not the best way to pray. Sometimes God promises, uh, or here's the prayers of his children. Sometimes he answers no, but other times God answers might be 
wait, or maybe even have something better in mind. And we'll respond to our prayers in a way that we do not expect or imagine. We don't control how God chooses to act, but we do trust that God hears us and that we can indeed depend on him. That is why the psalm, the same psalm that we read earlier, 115, goes on to say confidently, you who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The Lord has been mindful of us. He will bless us. Down on the bottom left-hand part, reading God's word, you'll see three verses there. Let's go ahead and read those together quickly. John chapter 14, verses 13 through 14. Jesus said, Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. John chapter 15, verse 16. Jesus said, You didn't choose me. But I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, it should last. So that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Ask in my name. Bottom of page six. In the verses printed to the left, notice that Jesus says, whatever you ask in my name. When we pray, one thing to ask ourselves is whether what we are praying for is something that God wants or whether we're just really asking in our own name for what we want. To ask in Jesus' name means that our prayer is for what he wants according to his will. As we'll see in future sessions, prayer is not about our will being done. It is about God's will being done. We can always be confident in prayer that God is in charge. By faith and trust, we place our cares and our concerns into his hands. This is the confidence that we have toward him, 1 John says, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. So one of the great things then about the Lord's Prayer is God uh, doesn't leave any mystery out there. He says, this is my will. These are things you should pray for. And so when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we confidently expect that these are things that are according to His will and that we're entering into that relationship and that God intends to answer that prayer. One more thing we're going to do before our time is up today, page number seven. I want to read one more Bible story with you. We're not going to do all the questions underneath it, although you're welcome to do that if you would like. But one of the uh, things that Jesus does when He's teaching is sometimes He makes up these parables, these these stories that he throws alongside the main point that he's teaching. And it's something that it's easy for us to remember. And as we think and maybe meditate on the story, uh, we're reminded of one of God's truths. And so we're going to end today with Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 18. This is a parable that Jesus throws alongside his teaching about uh, being persistent in prayer. Uh, that it's something that we do continually and often over and over. Let's read. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray and to not lose heart. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, Grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, Yet, because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes... Will he find faith on earth? This persistent widow practiced a faith. It wasn't even a faith in the unjust judge, but it was a faith that says, I need to keep asking and knocking and, and seeking for justice because this is important to me. And God says, that, that's what I'm looking for out of my children. I want them to pray, and I want them to pray persistently like that. That Jesus says, my Father honors people who are like 
this persistent widow. And so as we be, uh, come to the end of our introductory um, session on the Lord's Prayer, we're going to keep this story in mind that God uh, really highly values our persistence in prayer. Well, as I mentioned, we're going to do some praying. This one's not a written down prayer. I, I like to do those on Sunday mornings in church. Um, but there's also times for us to pray spontaneously for things. And so if you'll allow it, uh, I will pray for you guys tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're grateful uh, to be starting this unit on prayer. Prayer is kind of a mystery to us. We don't know how it works all the time. And so we're going to be glad to study it. And we pray that as we do, you would teach us how to pray and that you would remind us to pray and to pray persistently. And so tonight, what do we pray for? Well, we're glad to be uh, heading back to school. We, we pray for health and, and safety to be in our schools and in the families and in the, uh, all of the people of this community. Uh, so we do pray for that tonight. We pray that you would help us. This uh, online learning thing's been kind of tough on grades. Uh, my house and their house probably as well. Uh, help us uh, to learn. Help us to be good parents uh, trying to help our kids to learn. Bless the teachers as they keep transitioning back and forth. It's a tough time for them. We ask you to bless them. We also ask your blessing upon the administration of the school as they continue to, to make decisions, uh, hard decisions. It's hard to be a leader. And so we want to hold them up in prayer, God, and, and, and say, uh, help them out. Uh, give them wisdom. We uh, pray for our nation tonight as well. It's kind of uh, nervous and scary times watching all the strange stuff going on at the Capitol and as the inauguration for, Vice Pre or for President-elect Biden comes up, um, well, we get nervous. We hope that'll go smooth, but uh, these are nervous times for us. And so we do pray for our nation, Heavenly Father, that you would be at work, especially in the deep divisions uh, that do divide us. Help us to be people, by the way, um, who are, are, are peacemakers, and that we're not adding to the trouble, but we're trying to find ways where, where we can be a part of your kingdom work, which brings people together. So help us to be people like that. And tonight, as we go to bed, Heavenly Father, we pray for rest. These bodies of ours need a good night of sleep. As our bodies grow and as we learn things, we know that that uh, nighttime sleep is an important part of how you created us. So bless these guys with good sleep tonight. These things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, and we pray as he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, students, as you go on your way tonight, may the good Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May he look on you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. All right, take a picture, send that to me, or bring it next week. Looking forward to next week, the 20th of January. We'll be together downstairs, 6 p.m. We'll see you then.